and <coughs> the standards propagated up to a certain point, but only on the top layers of them. The actual propagation of standards throughout the population did not come until the late 1900s, and this is, this is now doesn't have an exact date because it occurs in different places at different times, with the creation of compulsory edu primary education in the standard. which now involves not a single organization, but an entire network of primary schools, an entire network of grammar schools, dispersed throughout the national territory. And of course, the institutionalization of the obligation to learn, I mean, to go to primary school. Since we were born in the 20th century, and we take this for granted, we just went to grammar school because that is what you do, we don't understand the momentous change that this, was, that this implied. All of a sudden, education was not an option. It was an obligation. This is the next stage in the evolution of the order word, to use again the Deleuzian thing, because it was compulsory. And the whole point of primary school, and this is clear in the name grammar school, is to teach you the standard, to teach you the correct way of speaking English, teach you the correct way of speaking Italian, to teach you the correct way of teaching French. And so, we come, we come to the 20th century when Chomsky and Saussure created theories. Because they used themselves only as informants, and at that point, language has literally been frozen, except in those enclaves where community relationships, as I was saying at the beginning of the class, have kept dialects alive. It, it was natural for them to think that language indeed had an unchanging quality to it. That language was in fact much more fixed than it in fact was. Of course, Saussure does distinguish between the diachronic aspect of language and the synchronic aspect of language because he is, he's not dumb. He's aware that language changes. But he puts that change in a special category which is subservient to the main category. The synchronic aspect, which is the aspect in which language has a certain inherent homogeneity. And Chomsky doesn't even get that, that, that subtle. Chomsky says, language is homogeneous, period. It evolved in our brains, and we have a universal grammar, which is just basically an instantiation of his mathematical model, in our brains, in the Broca region, or in, the vernicular, in any other of the regions of, of, of our brain that are specialized for language. And everything else is just variations that are accidental. The real necessary aspects of language, the essence of language is in our brains. But the Luz and Gattari want you to, to, to understand that it, it was a historical process through which this evolved. It was not, it was a contingent historical process that entrenched certain standards simply because Paris won over Lyon, for example. It could have been the other way around. The region that Lyon <coughs> commands, Burgundy, could have won, for other reasons, military or otherwise, over the Ile de France, and now the standard French would be the, the, the one spoken in Lyon, not this one spoken in, in, in Francien. Lyonese and, and Aragonese, for instance, which were the rivals of Castilian, had in fact more prestige at the, at the beginning of the millennium than Castilian had. It was mostly because of the war of reconquest against the Muslims that, that, that Castilian-speaking troops took first Toledo and then went on to take Sevilla, Granada, Cordoba. And as the troops began to, to, to carry the language with them and as prestige for the triumphs in war began to, to kind of leak into the language they spoke, Castilian began to acquire more prestige than the other, than the other dialects and eventually won. Of course, he didn't win against everyone. He didn't win against, for instance, Catalan. Even, even Generalissimo Franco tried to make Catalan illegal, you know, the language spoken in Barcelona, and it was illegal as long as Generalissimo Franco was alive. But the moment that poor bastard died, <laughs> Catalan made a comeback. And today you go to Barcelona and it is at least on an equal level as Castilian, if not superior. 
and there's been all kinds of other things, you know, how Irish was recovered from, from, from almost being lost towards the end of the 19th century uh, by groups of intellectuals and literary clubs that I cannot go right now into here. I need to, to add one, two more things before I, take, I start a question and answer period. Number one, the Los Angatari used this theory or used this conception of language based on Labov, based on Austin, based on the idea of elocutionary force and acoustic matter that has a certain, a certain force of commitment and that it evolves over many centuries to be transformed and, and undergo different becomings to try to understand questions about literature, for instance. And here I'm not going to be able to go into a lot of deep detail because literature, as art in general, are, are my weak point. But just to, just to connect it with the word of the Lusengatari, for you guys who are in, in more, more knowledgeable about this, to then be able to, to follow that line of thought. In their book on Kafka, for instance, they introduce a distinction between major languages and minor languages major languages, always being typically a standard language of a dominant nation. And minor languages being all those other dialects which may or may not have a written system, that it may or may not be patois, as, 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 as a dialect without a written system is called, but nevertheless exist and are spoken, and, and communities exist who take pride on that particular language. And they are trying to develop a theory of, of literature, or at least of certain aspects of literature, by focusing on authors like Joyce, like Kafka, whose mother tongue was a minor language, Irish in the case of Joyce, Czech in the case of Kafka, but who then moved on, or who, who there migrated to another city with more excitement, with more artists to, to, to share your ideas and so on, but who was in which another major language was spoken. So Joyce did not really write in, in Irish, he wrote in English. Kafka did not really write in Czech, he wrote in German. And what they are trying to do with that distinction between major and minor languages is precisely to say what does the speaker of a minor language brings to a major language? What can we see in the style of Kafka and in the style of Joyce that, that enriches English precisely because it is it is, it is now spoken by someone whose mother tongue was different. Again, you know, I consider myself a case of this, even though I don't write literature, because of course my mother tongue was Spanish, and all my books are written in English. And from my own experience, what I can tell you is, you know, I try to, I try, I try to bring as much clarity as possible to English, because I don't, I'm never sure whether a complex sentence that's more flourished, and perhaps more you know, stylish, whether it actually means what I want to mean. And so I write the first draft always with a little more flourish and a little more style, and then when I read it again I go, hell, I don't know if that means what, I, what I'm trying to say. You know, <laughs> frankly, you know, I've been here for 30 years in this country, in the United States, but I don't know what that sentence means, so let's just change it for the very simple one. And when I end up with my books, I, I have brought something to English, a certain clarity. A certain, a certain very, a very kind of streamlined style that only someone whose mother tongue is different than English can bring. I'm not going to elaborate much more on that because, as I said, I don't know that much. But if you, I mean, I don't know, don't know that much about literature to start bringing different examples and start making comparisons. But if you want to use the Lewis and Gattari as part of a theory of literary criticism, as part of a theory of literary a production, all the ideas that I just mentioned are necessary because without all of this, that is, without considering language something that exists outside our minds, that changes as a materiality, that is shaped by our palate and our tongues and our teeth and our lips, without, without thinking about language as ultimately being based on obligations, obligations to transmit within a certain community because the community acts as an enforcement mechanism, obligation to stick to the standard because now you are, are part of compulsory education, uh, primary education in the standard, without thinking about the order word and, and the materiality of language, it's going to be very hard to apply the Lewis and Gattari to literature, or at least to extend the ideas that they have developed in the realm of literature. To finish the, the talk, I want to consider one more aspect. Once standard French, 
Standard English, Standard Tuscan, and later on Standard Italian, Standard German, came into existence that were enforced. They began to compete in, with one another to become the international standard. They had already become the national standards in their own countries, but now the question was, and this is of course part of colonialism, and partly, um, um, particularly the 19th century version of colonialism, when Africa was finally carved up among all the different European powers, for example, uh, they were trying to now propagate their standard and try to make it the international standard. 